like to make announcements? And hello, everybody. Welcome to our 10th class. And uh, for long summer classes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, I wanted to do some announcements. Um, Allie's class is, her second class is this Tuesday at 6.30 on the Minor Tarot. And then Christopher will start up a new series of classes starting on Thursdays, uh, September 9th at 6.30 called Astrological Indicators for Success. So those are the classes that are ongoing now. Um, I'm doing two chapters this week, chapters 10 and 11, and um, there is something to offend everyone in those chapters. <laughs> there really is. <laughs> so I skipped all that part. <laughs> if you'd like to be offended, you can read it. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so uh, I've cut through a lot of the stuff, and I didn't go through all of chapter 10. Um, I, I did like about half of it, so, you know. You guys have the books, you can always read along. <laughs> so, with that, I guess... Oh, and there's one other thing I wanted to read that I told you about last week, about the cells, and I'll just read this real quick. In the 1950s, when they invented the electromicroscope, they went looking for the terms that make us psychic. Scientists said we have receptors for the 3D dimension that we live in, the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and skin. And so they said, if we, have a, if we have psychic abilities, then we must have receptors for them. And they define these receptors as cells and groups of cells that can receive and interpret electromagnetic stimuli. And they found we have millions of these cells all over our skin, and we have receptors in our nose that can smell other people's emotions and intentions. And these things tune in, and you can learn how to tune them in, or sometimes they will just spontaneously tune them in. So in other words, the, the, the scientists discovered the psychic cell, so, so to speak, and it's the same thing that Zane talks about, the thought cell. Well, he talks about thought cells, but, you know, I thought that was interesting, and that's what I told you I was going to read to you. Okay, and with that, I guess we will start the chapters. Where did you find that quote? Um, Rick Collingwood, it was in a, a he uh, did late night radio. Oh, look at Tarcha. And he did a whole thing, but this little part I wrote down because I thought it was so fascinating. All right, so we're starting in chapter 10, Subliminal Thinking. Startling as it may seem at first thought, it is nevertheless true, as demonstrated by the research of laboratory psychologists, that most of man's thinking is done below the threshold of objective consciousness. While this type of mental activity may be called unconscious thinking, Many psychologists still prefer to employ the word subliminal thinking, sub meaning under and line and meaning threshold. Subliminal thinking refers to those mental processes which take place below the threshold of objective consciousness. Well, that's, like, that's not so startling these days, though, is it? Because no. we, can, we can look at pictures of the brain and right, right. We know what's going You know, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I think that was that came out like then back in Zane's yeah. time, so it was startling. <laughs> <laughs> but a psychologist has quite correctly compared man's total thought to an iceberg. The small section of period above the water represented by a proportion objective thought, and the immense volume out of sight beneath the waves represented by proportion the subconscious or subliminal thought. So, subliminated things. Oh, that's subliminated. I thought it said subliminal. <laughs> a wide variety of experiments have been devised to demonstrate that streams of thought constantly pass through the astral consciousness of which we have no objective recognition. These thought processes of the unconscious mind are more active and numerous than those of the objective conscious mind, which are only successful when etheric vibrations impart their energies to the cells of the physical brain to gain objective attention. This is kind of just reiterating this stuff. This I put up here because um, the conscious mind analyzes things and plans and has short-term memory. The subconscious mind has long-term memory, emotions and feelings, habits, relationship patterns, addictions, involuntary bodily functions, 
creativity, developmental stages, spiritual connection, and intuition. So there's a lot more going on in there, <laughs> obviously. Okay. One of the most interesting convincing of these experiments illustrates the inability of anyone to pick a name or number at random. Careful analysis by the method of pre-association reveals that every such attempt brings to conscious attention a name or number which, without being so recognized by the objective mind, is associated with and thus becomes a symbol of some strong desire. So he went on to kind of give an example of um, some guy wrote a book, and what, somebody asked him why he picked a character's name, and he said, oh, I just, uh, I don't know where it came from, and then Zane says that you can find out where those, so to speak, random things come from, that they're not just random, they, they went into your subconscious, and that your subconscious holds on to it, and then every once in a while it come up into the objective world. This, of course, is in conformity to the law of association by which succeeding mental images are always related through resemblance or contiguity with images to which the attention had previously been directed. So I did this as an example. I had this up before. This resembles this in a form, and then this resembles this. So we're associating these things. The three hereditary drives and other desires always have thought energy in a state of tension striving for release. The drive for significance can largely be obtained through comparison with others. A person who is conscious that he makes mistakes is apt to feel less inferior when he perceives that other people make the same mistakes. If a person attempts to bolster up the feeling of superiority, not through the attempt to reach a higher level, but through tearing other people down to a lower level than one's own, is a trait taken advantage of by politicians. And of course, I wrote, it's not a very uplifting way to feel good about yourself <laughs> just by tearing other people down. <laughs> the unconscious mind, in its frantic effort to maintain its own sense of superiority, does not like to admit that others have greater ability or more worth. So that, then they say it's the unconscious mind that doesn't like that. Consequently, when other people who have attained greater success or importance get into difficulty, or charges are brought against them, this can give the thought cells related to significance great pleasure. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I wrote, because unless you change your thinking to raise the vibration, where, you know, you don't get pleasure from seeing other people, even if they're very successful, and, and they're rich, and they're famous, mm -hmm. you know, being teared down. I think that's when you go to a higher level, when you don't get pleasure out of that, right. you know. I think a lot of people do take pleasure in it, though. Right. But sadly. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It arises from a conscious feeling of inferiority, and the endeavor to compensate and find satisfaction for the drive for significance, not through constructive channels, but through the subversive means of making others seem inferior. So. Yeah. <laughs> So did they banish him to the corner, or did he <laughs> isolate himself? <laughs> uh, I think he's doing it himself. <laughs> uh, I'm struggling for pictures now. I'm like, I need to get new pictures, and it's hard, harder to find pictures as I'm going. <laughs> if the mishap to another is serious, the energies of the more civilized thought cells are released, rather than those of the drive for significance. There is a feeling of sympathy for the other, or the impulse to do something to remedy his plight. So, if it's just something mild, I guess you take pleasure, but if it's more serious, then something else builds up. Um, no one could laugh at the death of another, because the thought cells stimulated more directly by a tragedy are those whose desires strain for release and efforts toward the preservation of human life. So, when Michael Jackson, you know, he had all those problems, and people had various thoughts about him, you know, but then when he died, everybody just said, oh my God, what a tragedy, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, that Good kind example. of right, brings up other energies. <clears throat> a higher expression of the drive for significance is when an individual who champions another or their cause may sympathetically identify himself with the other individual or cause. The person then seems, in seems an expression of himself. 
verse, I think it's supposed to be season, it's version of himself. This person enjoys vicariously another's virtues and triumphs, and the greater a person's merits and successes, the more his own sense of significance is elevated. So, can you think of an example of that? Like, um, I think of like, like when Madonna was just starting out, I didn't really like her, but uh -huh. then as she got more, I started liking her music, and then I started learning about her life, and I, you know, I was always, even though she did some crazy, you know, sex book and all that, <laughs> you know, I was, I was like, you know, when she started doing Kabbalah, I was like, yeah, you go, girl. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. 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 But isn't this when somebody's uh, um, glorying in someone else's success, but still feeling personal uh, um, responsibility or uh, um, pleasure or something? It's like your that? significance is elevated. Your drive for significance, I guess that's what we're talking about. So that is elevated. It can be either elevated by tearing somebody else down, which is not a high expression, or by associating or feeling pleasure when somebody else is elevated and just kind of, you know. And you associate yourself with that person. Yeah, exactly. You say, oh, that person's so great. Well, so am I. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm just like that person. <laughs> or I just want to be like that person. <laughs> okay, the cause of laughter. This I'll read. I never remember either. Is it spring back, fall forward? You get the astrophysicist guy. <laughs> Cause of laughter. But when another person places himself in a position of inferiority on purpose, or through some error or action of no great consequence, such as through a blunder in action or in speech, this affords the necessary stimulus and the avenue to objective consciousness through which the desire energies of the drive for significance find access to the nervous system. Okay. They then generate electrical currents that flow over the nerves and produce laughter. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so a small blunder, you know, yeah. somebody trips and falls. That which is humorous releases desire energies that have attained a high degree of tension through presenting situations in which no one suffers severe harm. So, you get this one? <laughs> Stop playing with your food. These <laughs> <laughs> little vampire <laughs> tusks. <laughs> Wit also, if cleverly applied, suddenly releases desire energies, which have tension enough that when they find access to the nervous system, they produce laughter. But wit is not altogether harmless. You're going too fast for me. Yeah, you it all. Okay. Hey. Good. How do you talk? Hundred dollar fine for speeding and two fifty for misleading the public. Says I'm sexy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, too frequently, wit wounds someone or tends to cause another painful discomfort. And this is why I put this one up. I may be drunk, miss, but in the morning I will be sober and you will still be ugly. Notice the beauty that said it. <laughs> the <laughs> exemplary beauty. Right. Right, <laughs> it. right exactly. <laughs> So uh, I guess that's an example of wit being a little bit, you know, painful or discomfort. Therefore, while people laugh at witty remarks because it enables some strong desire to find pleasant release, others unconsciously tend to distrust and resent the one who causes the pain from witty remarks. People who wound others, even when they cause laughter, are never popular. And that's so true. Some people are out there and they just make fun of everybody. And you might laugh, but you never tell them anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that, is that, that like, Rod, what was his name? Rodney Dangerfield or yeah. something like that? I mean, oh, yeah. He, Some of the you know, he was, was just there. like, oh, God, I don't, you know, it was yeah. very painful to listen to this. Really? Yeah, I, he, I can is, think of other. He, yeah. 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 Uh, so he just saw Kathy Griffin. Griffin. Kathy Griffin's pretty damn harsh. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like her humor. Right. I, I just, I'm right. Just, it amazes me that people find humor in all. Right, I know. You know, in yeah. high school I learned that there were two kinds of, they called it satire. Horatian satire, which is uh, well-meaning, and juvenilian satire, which is twist the knife, dig yeah. it in, mean, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. 
and they were both named after Roman Caesars or something like that. <laughs> Horatio. Horatio. Horatio was a writer, right? Yeah. And, and Juvenalian would be, a, it's not Jove. It's not associated with Jupiter, yeah. but it was an emperor. Who was childlike? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> childish. He was a mean one. Yeah. Yeah, an individual can poke fun at himself and everyone will like him because the drive for significance finds so much satisfaction and releasing its energies through perceiving weaknesses in someone else. And when an individual deliberately holds up his own weaknesses, no resentment is felt, for it is recognized that he is not suffering greatly, but apparently finds pleasure in pointing out his own follies. Well, actually, you know what I think happens is that I always have a lot of respect for people who can laugh at themselves. Most people do, yeah. Because I think of them as being comfortable with themselves. Exactly. You know, they yeah. must like themselves. And I think it's like an understanding that we all make little slips and mistakes yeah. and blunders and we can all laugh at it. It's, you know. All right. You know, it's, it's, yeah. So I put this <laughs> other one. I turned down a raise because I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure. About that. <laughs> uh, okay. It might seem strange that an individual could find pleasure in his own discomfort were it not for own understanding of the process of conditioning. They have conditioned themselves to view their own conduct as it appears to others and find keen pleasure in discovering shortcomings and errors. Because sometimes people bust themselves yeah. Uh, humorously, before other people are going to bust them. Yeah. <laughs> They'll do it to diffuse other people's ability to criticize them. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, it gives them a sense of superiority and thus releases the energy of the drive for significance. To be able to recognize that which is ridiculous, even if it pertains to themselves. I love finding ridiculous things about myself. <laughs> <laughs> The ability to do this is a valuable asset because when we recall any situation of the past or view any predicament of the present as a subject of merriment, then we can honestly laugh at it and this releases that situation's emotional energy. It's amazing how much of our um, awareness is, is tied up with our with this Self. sense of, of significance. Signif yeah, yeah. I think it's... I think Zane's right, it's right there. I mean, it's really it's perfect. right on the surface, isn't it? Yeah, and he kind of really talks about that through this book that I, you know, I, I was kind of like, I thought it was just, you know, he, he, he puts it as a drive for significance, which really mm -hmm. makes me more aware of that. Mm -hmm. That it's, yeah, it's, it's part of us. So very much. It also reconditions the thought elements derived from the experience, which may have been repressed and through the pleasant conditioning energy thus contributed, prevents the formation of an inharmonious thought compound. So if you're, you're, if you're laughing at it yourself and you're releasing this, mm -hmm. this prevents the formation of an inharmonious thought compound. And so it's actually healthy to do that. It, it, it's not just preventive for the future, but it can heal the past. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. When people take themselves and their affairs too seriously, there's apt to be painful conditioning energy built into the thought cells whenever things do not go just as they desire. Oh, yeah, so true. <laughs> I remember these girls in high school that would laugh out loud hard when people were walking in, it was winter, you know, snow, walking into school, and there'd be groups of people standing out, and they would laugh hysterically, really out loud when somebody slipped or something, you know, just a little like that. And I'm like, you're ridiculous because you know one day you're going to do it and you're going to do it hard and you don't want people to laugh at you, you know? Yeah. And then when they do slip, they're not laughing, they're just like horrified and like, let go of that energy. <laughs> Release it and just, <laughs> those people are so um, uptight though. To prevent taking things too seriously, a sense of humor becomes highly valuable. When you can laugh at experiences that when occurred, when they occurred, gave rise to shame, embarrassment, feelings of inferiority, remorse, etc. The emotional energy they built into the astral body will no longer be able to do much harm. That's so that's the best the part. part. Yeah. Exactly. And here's a little comic I <laughs> laughed at. It says, all the other women in the office are suing you for sexual harassment. Since you haven't sexually harassed me, I'm suing you for discrimination. <laughs> 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 Can't win. <laughs> oh, 
but laughter may be caused by the energy release of other powerful desires as well, like the drive for self-preservation and the drive for race preservation, which also have thought energies that with proper stimulation find emotional release. She says, just take it to 2012. That's when we switched to the Dilbert calendar. <laughs> <laughs> the end of it. Paul, <laughs> <All> very happy. <laughs> he loves Dilbert. Uh, okay, and so Zane had a few examples of this, and some of them were kind of offensive. And I'm not even part of their group, so he's. <laughs> but you know what I mean? He talks about Jewish jokes, Scottish jokes, sexual jokes. And I'm leaving that all out. <laughs> right. Well, but you know yeah. what? When I was a kid, and it probably still is true in certain groups, but when I was a kid, it was not uncommon. It was actually the um, people, uh, com uh, comedians. Mm -hmm. They made a living off of making fun of racial uh, groups. Yeah. Do yeah. you remember that? And a lot of yeah. them were Jews making fun of Jews. Of Jews. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, they did. Okay. They would, but they would racially stereotype or uh -huh. uh, oh, okay. and, and then make humor about it. So it's only okay if it's you're in that group, and then you can make fun of it. Yeah. But if you're not, then everybody gets offend offended. Well, right. I think that uh, over time, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I actually I think people did not like it. Right. And that's why it's over time it has changed because... You know, Wops didn't like being called Wops, and right. Spicks didn't like being called Spicks. And, and, and I don't think it's just the, the word, the name, it's what's attached it's to what's it. It's what's attached to it, right. Yeah, all that thought and feeling, you know, right. the energy behind it and all that. But in a way, that's like, um, <clears throat> like, like the way the rappers, the black rappers, will use the N-word referring yes. to themselves now. Uh -huh. right. It's diffusing the negative connotations of the past by making fun of them in the use of the word to refer to yourself. There's a, there's a sense of this same process going on. But the thing about it is, other people still can't use that word without right. offending everybody. Right. In my opinion, and, and Oprah brought this up that she had people on about that. There was a controversy a couple of years ago about mm -hmm. some prestigious person using the N-word. And um, Oprah had a, a, a black person on that said, you know, I'm offended even when other black people say mm -hmm. it because it gives the other people the okay, and it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't use it, so I'm against it being used by anybody. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Am I Laura opinion? Schlesinger just this last week resigned or, she, or you know, got yeah. busted for using the N-word yeah. 12 times <laughs> on the air. And, and yeah, yeah, it's it's way not okay. Yeah, and people. I don't think it diffuses if the if rappers do it in their songs. I don't like no, it. I don't like hearing it in the songs. same mechanism. Uh, With, and she did it. Using it. No, right. she, so she, she did it higher in any way. Right. She, and she, quit. she Yeah, I heard something about she, she, she considered it a violation of the First Amendment rights. Oh. Right, but she apologized. She did. Oh, did she, she said apologize? that, and at the same time, she said she did consider that. That's one of the reasons that she apparently she is retiring because she no longer feels like she has the freedom to express herself. Yeah, which you know, and and here is the thing, we do have that freedom. People can say that in public thing. It's socially unacceptable. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so we see. we do have social things that you know are, are you know in the forties and fifties. You know the the sex thing. Socially, it wasn't okay, you know, to have affairs and all that. Um, and now we've, we've gotten rid of that, but now it's like about our speech and what we can and can't say, even though it's legal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our social structure keeps everybody up to par. Well, we try to anyway. Yes? Well, you know, an, an interesting thing, I've often thought that it's better to, uh, for people to use the words until they... Um, become okay. For example, like Okie, if you were back in the 30s, <laughs> and being an Okie was really, I mean that, the connotation there was bad. I mean these people oh, yeah. were the lowest form of life in California, okay? But everybody in Oklahoma says they're an Okie now. Over the years, nobody thinks anything of it. In fact, they're proud to say, yeah, well I'm an Okie. Right. All right. Well, Will Rogers made that what, possible. What happened, huh? They said Will Rogers made that possible by by saying that it was a good thing when all the Okies moved to California because it raised the IQ in both states. <laughs> <laughs>
That is funny. I think it's... <laughs> so yeah. what about that? Because I think it's that over time now, it's not the, the people that have the Dust Bowl that all were traveling, they're all very poor, and they went to California looking for jobs, right? And so people disparaged them and degraded them, and so Oki became a bad term. But over time, they're not doing that anymore, so then the, the word doesn't have that bad connotation well, for if, generations. You know, around. instead of wearing I'm an Oki, but what if uh, African Americans went around with a button and said, uh, I'm an N-word, and if you or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, then, you know, and that's why they're, you know, it is changing the, I don't know. But it takes humor. I think that that's humor. the thing. Yeah. It does take yeah. humor until you can, I mean, as, if there's tension out there, like, for example, in the 30s and 40s, you know, or during the, the early part of the 20th century, there were a lot of ethnic groups that, might, that immigrated to this country, and they were all having to learn to live Right. in close proximity to one another. And there was a lot of tension. And so it's through humor mm -hmm. that you can, um, right. but it's gotta be humor. Yeah. Real yeah. humor, I think, that can, can yeah. transform it. Yeah. There was a, when I was in the military uh, basic training, there was a kid from Ethiopia. And it was, you know, the Ethiopian famine and all that. And he used to make a joke. He said, yeah, I'm from Ethiopia. He says, what, what am I? <laughs> Ethiopia and with a piece of rice stuck in your throat. <laughs> and you would make that joke whenever you met, met somebody. Right. Right. You know? yeah. But, you know, to diffuse the humor and stuff like that. Right. Because, yeah. you know. But, yeah, yeah. you're right. Humor. But, humor and you have works. to recognize that it's the, it, it is a tool that you're using to release the tension. Right. So when Dr. Laura Schlesinger was caught using the N-word, I don't think she was trying to use humor to release the tension. I heard some newscasters say they went back and listened to the broadcast and it was very, very mean-spirited. Yeah. Not, not a light use of it. Right. Okay, something's going wrong. This is not well, it turns out she's a pretty socially she's conservative person, right? And politically conservative. Yeah. Yeah, apparently. Can I help you out with that? You might have to. Hey, the battery. Hey, where did yeah, you find the these bad two good-looking guys in one picture? Of one? Yeah, this is nice. Well, well I found them separately. Are they double, triple? They're uh, triple A's. Sometimes, if you just pull them out and put them back in, it helps a little bit. These are wonderful pictures of these two attractive men. Yeah, laughter. Yeah. yeah. Thus the kind of jokes an individuals laugh at, and the things he considers funny are rather good measure of his intelligence and spirituality. That's the ultimate point, how sophisticated and um, many-layered sometimes the humor can be, you know. What is the What the heck? I thought you said no, doubles. Uh, no. Oh, you want <laughs> Yeah. Cause of okay. oh. Oops. swearing. <laughs> yeah, cause of swearing. Because the strongest impressed desires possess energy under the greatest tension, the jokes releasing their energies are the ones people laugh at the hardest. Likewise, people swear and cry to release desire energies of high tension which can find no more adequate methods of expression. So some I, I don't know why that is, but sometimes when you swear it just kind of Releases that tension. <laughs> yeah. Not not a lot of it, but a little bit of it. <laughs> you know? I know friends that, yeah. who call them words of <laughs> right. power. I mean, I did, you know, it's I, true. I it's mean, true. You hear me working around the property and stuff. I mean, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I hope nobody's looking. Right. My neighbor can just hear me. Yeah, I sometimes apologize to my cats. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. Neil says the sound is better than ever. Oh, good. Well, that's good. So you changed something and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked up with this. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, good. What is this crap? Uh, <laughs> it's real food. It's food. <laughs>
He must be a relative of my boy prank. <laughs> so, the emotion of anger may find some relief through swearing if it is not permitted to express through more overt actions. Instead of lashing at an opponent or at an obstacle with a fist or foot, the individual lashes out with his tongue and gets some measure of satisfaction. Yep, but like you said, Paul said, it becomes a habit and then it's <laughs> not good. <laughs> Weeping may be from grief or from joy. In either case, the desires are stimulated to an intensity sufficient for emergency purposes. Mm -hmm. When they impart their energies to the nervous system, the electrical effects produce a profound disturbance with glandular rea reactions which are beyond control. So, that's uh, Tim Roth, he's an yeah. actor. Yeah. He's a good actor. He's a really good actor. A really good movie with him in it that is hilariously funny is called Four Rooms. Four Rooms? Four Rooms. Oh, Four Rooms. Yes, he's the bellboy in a hotel mm -hmm. in New Year's Eve and it's hilarious. Well, I think it's hilarious. Other people don't. <laughs> but I think it's hilarious. Uh, the existence of the energy under pressure, which thus seeks release and not finding a normal outlet, expresses in sim some symbolic manner. This may be decidedly disadvantageous to the individual, or it may be unrecognized due to the opposition of other groups of ideas, which exercise censorship over what enters the objective consciousness. Or it may be unrecognized because of the pain which was associated with the experience at the time of its formation. And we'll kind of explore that a little bit more. Mm. Just as we seek pleasant physical experiences, we also seek pleasant mental experiences. To avoid unpleasant mental experiences, we forget them. Usually. <laughs> that is why our childhood and past vacations seem to have been such happy periods. We retain a clear memory of all that was pleasant and have forgotten most of the incidents that at the time were considered almost unendurable hardships. And, I, and then there are some people that do remember, and, then all, and they seem to remember all the bad stuff and forget the good stuff. <laughs> you know, they've trained themselves to focus in on the negativity. And I would call that like a negative person, though, yeah. who, who totally forgets all the good stuff and focuses on just, you know, I'd call that a really miserable person. <laughs> and, and, I, and it becomes a habit. I actually have a friend like that. Yeah. And it's just been habitual, and he had to force himself, you know, to say the good things that did happen, you know what I mean? It was just a and negative as to thing. whether it's meant, you said they've trained themselves to only focus on the negative. That's, that's up for debate, whether really? they've consciously train themselves. I mean, I well, think not a lot of times it's, uh, that's a conditioning as well. Conditioning. That's not a matter of their own personal training. Don't you right. think it's a choice it's, though? Yeah. I know uh, I choose. I'm, I'm consciously, consciously perhaps, you know, yeah. but based on conditioning. I think there's lots of factors that make people tend one way or another yeah. and where we have to use the training is when we consciously try to uh, rectify those patterns. Okay, yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah, you're right. It's it's like conditioning, and then it yeah. forms a habit, yeah. and then and then it becomes unconscious because it is a habit. And then yeah. when somebody points it out, then they can train themselves to focus if on the positive. If they choose to, that's if where the choice to. comes in. Right. right, exactly. Well, I know you can't change it unless you make a choice. That's true. And become yeah. aware of it. In become the aware place. of it. Yeah, whether or not somebody else points it out. Yeah. But a lot of times when somebody else points it out, all you'll get, it, I mean, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction is denial and resentment and defensiveness and nothing gets changed. Right, right. right. That's right. Wait, the, t the wise teacher waits for the person to find their own answers. <laughs> Yet the energy of the experiences is still present in the pot cells of the unconscious mind. And when it is stimulated through association, it tends to modify the conduct. Okay, and, and Zane's example of that was like, for instance, if you had a bad experience with a person named XYZ, when you meet a new person and they have that same name XYZ, then you may easily forget the name or have an aversion to any person with that name and be biased. You know, I, I've done that. I had some bad experiences with this particular name and I met somebody and I said, well, I had a bad experience, but I won't be prejudiced against you. And then she turned out to be bad. And I'm like, oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now I am a really bad. More often than with names, it's with astrological signs. Ah. 
a lot of people will have one bad experience with a sign and make a prejudice against all the others mm, of that true. sign. Yeah, that's true. And then here's the uh, little funny, you fear shame something stupid? In layman's terms, cat's got your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guilt often happens when a person who sets himself an absolutely impossible standard of conduct may feel when he fails to live up to these false standards that he has indulged in the forbidden or even committed the unpardonable sin. It's quite unimportant whether the guilt is real or imaginary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, you know, have an impossible standard that, you know, people then start feeling guilty about stuff. Um, and this cartoon is, oh, I have it. A splendid new laptop, Miss Brimley. How on earth did you raise the funds? Here's Paul <laughs> needs a box, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of savings for oh, a spare <laughs> box. A spare box for the kids. <laughs> she can raise some funds. <laughs> okay, and on to chapter 11, and like I said, there's a lot more to chapter 10 that I didn't get a chance to get into. So I did the bulk of uh, the presentation on chapter 11. It's, it's pretty good creative imagination. So all creation is a result of giving something already in existence a new form. For all that is and all that ever will be has ever existed in some condition form before. Creative imagination, therefore, consists of rearranging the images already present in the unconscious mind, or which may be acquired for that purpose, into new combinations. And these are little um, rocks, like gratitude, love, joy. So I was thinking of like, like imagine all these rocks that you have in your unconscious and then rearranging mm -hmm. them <laughs> to make a sentence. <laughs> oh, joy. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Creative imagination's application implies that the unconscious mind shall possess stored experiences in a state suitable for use. And then energy of sufficient intensity should be applied to these stored experiences to cause them to enter into new and unique arrangements in relation to one another. But the unconscious mind made up of thought elements, thought cells and dynamic cellular thought structures is also influenced by desires. The formation of each thought element into thought cells and thought structures is accompanied with conditioning energy, an energy straining for release in a given direction, such as we call a desire. So, this was from one of the other chapters. Conditioning energy was like your feelings associated with experiences. <clears throat> Some of these desires are more powerful than others, and the desires are largely able to gain the attention of the unconscious mind, exerts an influence upon the fragments of experience. So is your desire stronger for candy or salad? <laughs> <laughs> an illustration of desire energy is somewhat parallel to that exerted by a magnet on iron filings. Place iron filings on a plate of glass and then lie there in a listless heap like the thought elements within the unconscious mind when unaffected by desire. Put, but put a horseshoe magnet under the glass and all is changed. The filings leap into definite and beautiful designs and follow all movements of the magnet. Desire energy is like the magnet which is responsible for all movement, all change of pattern, and all new combinations of mental factors within the unconscious mind. I thought that was wow. a great example of how desire works. You know? it's such a, yeah, it's a powerful example, isn't it? Yeah. I, see that. I was like, oh. <laughs> Our desires are just constantly rearranging. Yeah. Rearranging themselves. Well, yeah. and definitely. <clears throat> Creative work depends upon reproductive energies. Isn't that a great picture? Mm -hmm. Have you been there? So the, Is that the Vatican? Yeah. I've never been there. It's the the famous ceiling. Sistine uh, Chapel. Yes, Sistine Chapel. I was actually there. It's really small. <laughs> I was like, wow, I thought it would be bigger. But, 
So the energy released by the, the drive for self-preservation or the drive for significance is sufficient to cause trains of thought of intensity to pass through the unconscious mind. And some worthwhile new combinations may result from those thought processes set in motion. But the experiences of writers, composers, inventors, artists, and all to whom we credit creative work is that creative output of volume and importance on any plane that is dependent upon the creative energy of the drive for race preservation. So, so creativity is what did you just say? Yeah, it, we're going to talk about that. Okay. It's uh, it it basically that. So we have our three main drives, right? Uh -huh. And that um, these two drives have trains of thought of intensity. Okay, so have intensity. But it's like this type of creative energy comes from. Coming from the race of preservation. Yeah. In other words, the procreative instinct is for the creation of something outside of self. Through all time since the soul started its journey, the soul has been engaged in acquiring significance through producing something new. That's true. Yeah. Procreation has thus been specifically conditioned to create outside of self rather than to acquire, which is to gain something for the self, and thus is creative expression dependent upon sexual power. Back of all, behind all important creative activity and creative imagination that has value lies reproductive energy as a driving power. And as a corollary, the use of creative imagination and creative work of all kinds consumes sexual energy. Okay, and I wanted to read you something a little bit that I found on the internet in a psychology article. It says, there are some revealing studies on how feelings and thinking about love and sex impact creativity. Research by psychologists Jen Forster and others at the University of Amsterdam demonstrated that love makes us think differently in that it triggers global processing, which in turn promotes creative thinking and interferes with analytical thinking. Thinking about sex, however, has the opposite effect. It triggers local processing, which in turn promotes analytical thinking and interferes with creativity. In, in his Psychology Today blog post, Scott Barry Kaufman refers to that research study and others, including one, somebody else, showed that it doesn't matter if men are thinking about a short-term or long-term affair, in either case, their creativity was increased. For women, however, their creativity was only increased in the condition where they were imagining an affair with a long-term committed mate. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I, uh, thought, <clears throat> I thought that it just said above that talking, thinking about sex um, interfered. interfered with, but then that, uh, that was yeah. um, These were contrary. Well, th but they were, they, I don't like, think they were talking about sex in those... The, right. The, the, uh, the men were, yeah. women were long-term affairs with their partner. Yeah. Or, or no, with a committed mate. When committed they think mate. about that, their creativity is increased. But that's not being sexually driven. That, that's just more the romantic part of the brain. Is that what you're? Uh, is that what you're that distinguishing? Okay. Show that it doesn't matter if men are thinking about a short-term or long-term affair. In either case, their creativity was increased. So men's creativity is increased when thinking about a long-term affair or a short-term affair. Mm -hmm. For women, their creativity was only increased when in condition that they were thinking of a long-term affair. Mm -hmm. And above it, um, uh -huh. a psychologist demonstrated that love makes us think differently in that it triggers global processing, which in turn promotes creative thinking and interferes with analytical thinking. Thinking about sex, however, has the opposite effect, promotes analytical thinking and interferes with creativity. And it's, so one was like long-term affairs and short-term affairs, and the other one, so thinking about affairs, not sex, so affairs is like love affairs, right? right? So yeah. that's love, I would say. That promotes creativity. But for women, they go all analytical if it's not with a part, a, a, Long -term a a long-term partner or right. whatever. Hey, would they have what was the terminology for it? Um, long Stable partner. Long-term committed me. A committed me. Yeah. And a, a popular novelist said it this way: When I create, I'm not thinking. In a sense, you're better off not thinking about it. Like sex, you don't want to think. 
<laughs> but see, creativity does come, obviously, usually when you're just not thinking. But if you're thinking specifically about sex, that, that's analytical, and that doesn't promote creativity. That's what I think they're saying in these articles. Well, let's observe that and see okay. that's true. <laughs> uh, it's like Yogi Berra's quote, you can't think and bat at the same time. <laughs> right. But we will find that, you know, that creative energy, that sexual energy, is used in creativity. It's, you, okay, do you understand? Yeah. There's oh, like differences yeah. There. No, that, that seems pretty okay. Okay. Um, That is a modern biologist and psychologist have commented on the relation between sexual energy and creative mental output. Physiologists. Biologists what? and physiologists. Oh, what did I say? Psychologists. Oh, okay. <laughs> they hold that a person engaged in such creative mental work could not expend his sexual energies too freely through marriage relations without lowering his creative mental output. Whereas a person doing merely routine type of work would not be noticeably affected. Okay. <laughs> uh, do, do you understand what this is kind of saying? Well, I didn't hurt Tiger Woods. <laughs> right. But he didn't. He, he was just doing he wasn't his routine type just, of work. He was, exactly. He was doing routine for either way, work. either with the women or with the golf. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, with the women, but yeah, the golf is. Right. The key word is routine, right? Right. <laughs> You're not having to think about it. It's right. Routine. Exactly. But that's an interesting point. That that it almost seems like we have two cups of sexual energy, and if we're we using yeah. a cup and a half in our intensive, creative mental work, we only have half a cup left for our physical sexual expression. Exactly. And he does talk about that. He Unless you can that. move it into Is the regenerative. I got a picture of Picasso. <laughs> 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 okay, so we're still talking about this though. So those yeah, who four cups. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are Scorpio. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Those who would develop creative imagination, therefore, must not dissipate their creative sexual energies wantonly. Instead, they should learn to condition the reproductive desire to find a higher satisfaction through creating mentally, rather than in flowing through more physical channels of expression. Well, you know, does this... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, does this come back to this whole notion of desire energy? That if, if you're in a state of tension as a result of having a desire for something, yeah. are you more creative? If, you, if, you sublimate, if, you're, if you sublimate that, that he does talk about that. Okay. that if you, you know what I mean? If you have, okay, so you have a sexual desire for another person, right? Mm -hmm. If you sublimate that and you channel it, then you can channel it into creative energy and you have a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. But if you go ahead and go ahead and have the liaison, <laughs> you're then you're expending your, your creative sexual energy and now you're not creative anymore. Because you just expended it, right? Because he talked about that before, that you expend it once you use it. This is part so of what's behind the, um, uh, the belief that celibacy is uh, a more noble state than people who have sexual relations. It's part of what's uh, fueled the mystics through the years to uh, refrain from sex. Right. And I've just but been watching a show over and over again that PBS ran. I recorded it at the time and recently have watched it several times about Isaac Newton, who was a recluse and a celibate by choice. And his mental work, his furious um, mental work, was very consciously a way of keeping himself from obsessing about women. But, you know, I, I have a hard time. How do we know? you know exactly what he was thinking what he was doing you know how do we know he didn't get prostitutes on the side i mean is that going to be written about in history we don't know that you know Probably. i have, like, I have I a hard time believing there's that there's we quite a lot know exactly what know these people were life. doing and thinking yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean he wrote journals and he lived a certain kind of life and he was never married but we don't know like i mean you know what i'm saying yeah, I understand. <laughs> I do know. Yeah. How? Because oh, stuff because is written about it. People oh, watch yeah. that. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of evidence. You can't about ask you that question unless you've done all the research. I mean, if okay. you know that there 
is no, you know, that there's 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 nothing out there that talks about that, then you know, you've done. But don't research you think people are making assumptions about things? When they, you know, when people well, wrote about that person no. at, at a certain specific time, you know, because people weren't going to write about bad things like JFK supposedly had all kinds of affairs, but nobody talked about it. Oh, but they do now. Exactly. Well, so, so back I, then, people writing about a person in history, they might not want to talk about oh, certain people things. People are always wanting to. I, I think we have that desire to. Uh, unearth the unearth dirt. Unearth the dirt, yeah. Well, no, I know, but don't you think that when people were. <laughs> Propped up as a certain famous type of person, they didn't want to. Sometimes their secrets would remain in He has the enemy. He had enemies. Oh, absolutely. And he wrote well, about his journals his never came journals. back. Right. He his wrote about his own efforts to um, sublimate, if you will. Oh, he did. Okay. His sexual energies, and he okay. had a, he had a nervous breakdown, a crack up, where he started uh, accusing his good friend John Locke of uh, teasing him with. Harlots from the <laughs> local, you know, whorehouse. He 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 lost it mentally, okay. and Locke said, "Oh my God, you know, this is so outrageous. This is so apropos of nothing." And he's really gone nuts. Oh, okay. And and after a period of time, he pulled himself back together and made himself into a socially presentable person and entered a new era in his life. But it was a very interesting. Um, chronicle mm -hmm. of somebody who had not vented their sexual energy and had to, you know, had this cr enormous creative body of work right. that was just, that made him go down as the, perhaps the greatest scientist ever in all history, right. the greatest mind of any 500 year period ever known, you know, right. that kind of thing. Right. And at the same time, it was driving him nuts, you know. Well, because there is a thing, and and Zane says that repression is not the way to go. It and then it sublimation, sublimation will work for a period of time, but that is, that drive for uh, race preservation, so to speak, as Zane calls it. Um, what needs to happen is what mystics know, which is like tantric, uh, tantric sex yeah yoga and stuff like that where it's not just sublimating mentally you're actually physically moving your energies so that that energy is through you and it's there's it's, all different kinds exactly. of theories about that yeah but that's what i what i've heard and read that that's actually the way to go if you want to sublimate and create because it's only going to last that's so well, i think long because it's a material thing i think it has to have an expression in some cre physically creative act physical right. creative act Right. I don't think you can do it. Men I don't think you can mentally sublimate for for an extended it period. Exactly. Of sense. Exactly. Well, maybe that's oh, why I need a to wet dream could be concerned could, could be called a physically creative act because it's a release of those right. kind of right. energies. Right. Right. It just right. didn't didn't result in anything of great value. Right. <laughs> but the tantra is the one. The value to the person <laughs> who finally <laughs> had it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here's our nun. Oh, Fancy hey. that. Not that celibate life is necessary for creative work. <laughs> but that a reserve of the sexual creative energy should be present, which may be diverted as occasion demands into mental creation. While we occupy physical bodies, the intensity of both physical and mental activity is largely determined by the electricity generated in the brain and nervous system. Therefore, either physical or mental creative activity requires a high electrical potential, but mental creative activity requires an even greater electrical potential and even higher radiations of frequency than mere physical procreation. Than mere physical procreation. So, do you like my little demonstration? <laughs> so, you need a higher use a higher electrical potential when you're when you're imagining creative things, mm -hmm. and that. You know, a lower light bulb will work when you're procreating. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, for the specific generation of electrical energies, such as have intensity sufficient for use in procreation and other creative activities, by the cells of the brain and nervous system, the human body has special endocrine glands. These endocrine glands have secretions that generate electrical potentials especially adapted to meet emergencies. 
The secretion of adrenaline and cortin are hormones essential to life and secreted by the adrenal glands and meet the emergency of fight or flight. But different endocrine secretions, those of the gonads, meet the emergency of procreation and other creative activities. I didn't know it was an emergency. <laughs> like the nervous system, which sends electrical messages to control and coordinate the physical body, the endocrine system has a similar job but uses chemicals to communicate within the body. These chemicals are known as hormones. And this information, next couple of slides, this comes from this uh, website. Kind of just uh, gives you the basics about hormones and stuff, which I find fascinating. A hormone is a specific messenger molecule synthesized and secreted by a group of specialized cells called the endocrine gland. These glands are ductless, which means that their secretions, the hormones, are released directly into the bloodstream and travel to elsewhere in the body to target organs upon which they act. And so, and there's your, uh, the pituitary, I think that was, that, that controls all the other glands. It uh, regulates them. Right. So the hormones, are, are they sort of like your parasympathetic communication system? Things that are happening on this very subliminal level? Uh, no, no, no. Well, I think they do subliminal, but they, they'd they not be considered parasympathetic because that's part of the nervous system and this is... Well, right. Uh, this well, is the nervous system, system does send messages to to the glands, right. etc. But, but, the, but, the, but what I'm hearing is that the hormones are this... They, uh, they're just these chemical agents that, yeah. you know, if yeah. the body needs to go into fight or flight, it's got these little, me you know, yeah, these messengers, messengers and that start stimulating yeah. right. parts of the body, that organs that need to go there. Right. And because it goes right into the bloodstream, that's why it can go so fast. Whereas the nerves, you know, they're all over your body, but those, you know, the nervous system sends electrical messages to control and coordinate the physical body, the endocrine system communicates with chemicals. Well, I'm so maybe medulla. Electrical and chemical. At the level of the medulla. Yeah. Right? They're, yeah. I mean, it's, they're, they're totally unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what we, what are, are oh, yeah, yeah. we've evolved through lower life forms to get these systems functional, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but we, I think, um, they, we can, through our conscious mind and what we will, um, mediate their production mm -hmm. and how they affect us. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go into such panic, for instance, if we have practiced techniques of mm -hmm. mental calm right. or whatever. Right. But the, the pituitary gland does control all the other glands of how much. Like, So your adrenal glands, okay, an emergency happens, you need to fight. Okay, your adrenals are pumping it, but your pituitary, if it's in balance, then it'll control how much, and, mm -hmm. you know, and it won't overdose yourself too much, you know, when the emergency is over. So that's why you need the pituitary gland to Not be. the pineal gland? No. It's pituitary? Yeah. This is the I thought the gland. pituitary was this growth is like, hormone. It, yeah, yeah, it does. But it also controls all the other ones. It's the master. And what does pineal do? Um, I've heard different things. They, they still don't quite know exactly everything. I'm, I'm sure there's more research done, but what I've heard is not quite for sure. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I can do some. I, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, the location of the canal, that would be like the crown chakra, and that would be like the third eye, even though I thought the canal was like the third eye. I don't know. I always get confused. I think pituitary is a little lower down, like near yeah. the, the neck, no, and the pineal is more like the third Back. eye, yeah. I think. So the gonads are sex organs, in addition to producing the female ovaries and male testes, also secrete hormones. These hormones are called the sex hormones. The secretion of sex hormones by the gonads is controlled by pituitary gland hormones. <laughs> uh -huh. While both sexes make some of each of the hormones, typically male secretes testosterone while the female make estrogen and progesterone in varying amounts. But all, uh, both male and female have all, all of them. Mm -hmm. right. So now back to Zine. 
And these gonad secretions are especially adapted to generating within the brain and nervous system electrical energies of the proper potential and frequency to, to do creative work. See, he's saying that it's, uh, it's electrical, whereas the other one said it was chemical. The other, the biology website said it was chemical. Are we quite warranted in concluding that the glandular makeup of those people who do much creative work is su such as to give unusual sexual power? He wrote this as a statement. <laughs> I wrote it as a question. <laughs> what? Are we quite warranted in concluding that glandular makeup of those people who do much creative work is such as to give unusual sexual power? So why do you question it? Um, because, because, I don't know, they're saying, yeah, they're saying highly sexed people are more creative. Can't, aren't there very creative people that aren't? Newton, be an example. <laughs> well, he was consciously sublimating his energies, right. which is maybe what's being discussed in, in, he may be saying, Zane may be saying that the chemical uh. gonad secretions are adapted to being able to be used electrically in our higher centers. Mm -hmm. So okay. that may be the key to sublimating our creative energy from okay. sexual to, right. you know, other kinds of expression. Creative so that, vision. yeah, yeah right. so that maybe a person that is highly sex and highly creative, they just have more of the hormones in their body, as opposed to another person that might have less in their body, like their body produces less of those types of hormones. Maybe that's what, it, you know, that type of thing. Well, you have to have energy in order to create, right? Physically or mentally, right? So, but maybe but that's what this what this means. Yeah. Is it's just the hard? hard one. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> the sublimation of the sexual creative electrical energies, however, will produce a higher frequency and higher electrical potential in the brain and nervous system that enables a higher production of mental creative activities. In fact, a portion of the electrical energies responsible for physical procreation, sexual energies, have often been sublimated or diverted into a higher plane of expression in all important mental and artistic creations and in the exalted emotions of religious devotion. Under certain circumstances, and for these reasons, sublimation of desire energies can be practiced. Some of the most productive and famous writers, poets, composers, have had both bad and good reputations in their everyday lives. Some have lived unconventionally, and some have been quite conventional in their love lives. I summed up Zane's stuff here. <laughs> and I gave a few examples. Uh, he's very creative, musically. That's Bono from U2. Mm -hmm. uh, William H. Macy and his wife, what's her name? Uh, very creative, very expressive mm -hmm. actors. And they live, you know, conventional lives. Is she the one that's on? The house, uh, yes. Desperate house. Yes, she is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's one of them. And then uh, here's Picasso. <laughs> and then the other conventional that are very creative but are live unconventional lives. With uh, is Martha Graham famous for having had an unconventional life? Was she a lesbian yeah, she, or something? No, no. She uh, no. Actually, I, I put her as conventional. She was oh. actually very um, proper. She married this one person for a short time. She worked with him. Uh, for a long time, but then she married him, and then soon after got divorced, and she never. But she channeled all of her energies into her dance. Uh -huh. She danced um, for a very long time, into right. her like 60s or whatever. Right. And she was very creative in that area. Uh, some of these famous and creative people are successful in sublimating a large part of this excess of sexual energy and diverting the abundance of high electrical tension into the channels of their work so that their lives are quite regular. But other creative and famous people, having the same or even higher electrical tensions, are able to sublimate only a portion of the sexual energy into their work, and the remainder of this energy drives them into excessive living or into multiple affairs that are not sanctioned by society. So he's saying that, you know, some people, they, they, they just use their excessive energy to go out and have a lot of affairs or get into drugs and all kinds of things. I think that's what he's talking about when, he's, when he talks about, um, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but basically if you're ex like tantric, yeah. practicing tantric yoga, yeah. that if you're not, a, if you don't have a habit system of managing the energies that you're generating, yeah. they can 
Yeah, that, the Kundalini they can, can yeah, blow you out. It can really cause oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of excess in your life. <laughs> excess energy. Yeah. Uh, writers now quite generally recognize the relation between sex energy and creative output. Even the most dissolute among the more successful ones, while engaged in writing, live continent lives. Until the piece of work upon which they are engaged is finished, they refrain from alcoholic beverages and from too close association with the opposite sex. So wasn't that, was that Picasso? Did we, I, I didn't look that up about when he was creating, did he stay away from the sex and the women? No, I don't, I don't think so. Time. No? No, yeah, I don't think really? so. Mm -hmm. So he had excessive energy. <laughs> right. uh, then with the literary effort delivered to the editor, they go on a jamboree that justifies their reputation as drunks and what about oh, that? Okay. <laughs> Such a mode of life, which is followed by some people also in other lines of creative work, is reprehensible. But it nevertheless points to the working of a theory, which these people have discovered through practical experience, that for creative work, there must be a sufficient reserve of sexual energy. Well, he does a lot of ed editorializing in his commentary here, but at the heart of it, there is, I think what he's talking about is... Yeah. Exactly. He's, he's talking about very real energy. Right. He's just very influenced by his time and culture. Yeah. <laughs> and, his and here's a nice segue. Seance room. <laughs> yeah, right. Creative imagination, when it has sufficient electrical energy at its command, can produce the phenomena of the spiritualistic seance room. That the phenomena are commonly produced through the direction of the creative imagination of a disincarnate entity, rather than that of the person chiefly supplying the electrical does not invalidate the principle. Do well, have this I have a sure. I mean, I've known seance. people who see things, who claim to have participated in seances and yeah. contacted entities, but I've yet to have that experience myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you see this hand, though? Yeah. I guess that's supposed to be a picture of the materialization. He looks possessed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nothing develops the ability to see, feel, and hear psychically quicker than a complete suppression of the normal physical functions, especially the suppression of strong reproductive energies. But under such crowding and forcing, that which is seen, felt, and heard, although to one having the experience, it is most convincing, gives little information of value and a multitude of errors. I would kind of agree with that. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, are you doing it just for phenomena's sake? Because what is that going to give you? What does that do? Uh, just to say that ooh, some people have a lot happen. of valuable information or experiences out of participating in things like that. Have you ever been but, in a seance? I, I, um, uh, in a sense, I was in one of those things where we put our hands on a table and uh -huh. felt, felt the table start to levitate. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a Ouija board work. Oh, but, that freaks me out. But it uh, totally works sometimes, not all the time. But, but I, uh, I consider those more uh, low level and yes. Un yes. uncontrolled, whereas exactly. I've learned a method of uh, what's called directed writing, where you don't put yourself in a trance, but you ask for guidance from a higher level of consciousness or your inner guide, and then you you just write one word at a time what comes through and I've gotten incredibly valuable messages through mm -hmm. that. Exactly. And never felt like I abdicated my sovereignty or was taken over right. by an external entity or anything, you know. Exactly. But yeah. boy, what a useful thing to learn. Mm -hmm. I would recommend it to anybody to practice that one. Because that's coming from your higher self. Yeah, and, and, it's you, and I directly you. appeal to my right. higher self to right. be what comes through. Right. Could that be uh, like free association? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's how it yeah. works. Yeah. That's yeah. the yeah. mechanism yeah. through which the, the channel is mm -hmm. made, you know. Right. But, but it definitely doesn't feel like I'm generating this stuff right. that I'm right. hearing. But what useful information, it's changed my right. life at being able to, right. to do that. But I think Zane is saying that this is not very useful because right. you're going to get errors from disincarnate entities. I don't think he's saying that it doesn't exist. He's saying it, it, it's there, but it's not very useful because they're making errors on the other side of those people. You know, they're disincarnate. They're, they're lower, exactly. lower evolved, so as you right. said, more lowly. Although I've evolved. seen, uh, I 
got very fascinated by watching the TV show of John Edward, the guy who yeah. who mm -hmm. uh, does communicate with this with yeah. dead spirits, mm -hmm. and um, it is very helpful to the people who are living mm -hmm. to right. resolve unresolved issues, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, I think it's so. I think some people, people can right. yeah really use their talents in right. good ways this mm -hmm. way. Right. What they thought was seen or felt or heard was really an image, often a preconception in their own minds, into which had been drained high tension electrical energy. This, of course, presents no argument against the development of psychic senses through normal methods of enfoldment, nor against the proper use of creative imagination. So, creative imagination. Another use of that is uh, shamanic journeying. And, yeah. You know, the, um, getting. getting healing answers or a huge. Um, you know, symbolic experiences that throw great insight onto our questions. I had a, um, yes, Paul. Alice Marie says that she used directed writing at the Sphinx and gave very valuable information. Wow, cool. that's cool. That is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but you, you know, um, that's magnificent that she got to do it there, but I think we could we could appeal to the energy of the Sphinx wherever we are at any given moment and, you know, have a, a, a similar experience right. as mm -hmm. we don't actually have to go there and be there. That's part of the point of the creative imagination. Right, exactly. Now my sister actually had a really bad, weird experience with Luigi. Too. Yeah, a lot of people have. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, I played it, me and my sister played it as a kid and it never worked for us. I never thought it until when I was a teenager and my friend wanted to do it on New Year's Eve, you know, had a little party. And um, that, that thing freaked me out because it was freaking moving and I was like, oh my god, I didn't think this thing really worked. <laughs> and it wasn't until much, much later that I found out my oldest, she doesn't even want to talk about it, that's how bad it was of an experience. So you can really get some bad you need to stuff. qualify what you're appealing to. You, you know, want me to tell you the yourself. experience? <laughs> oh, okay. Do you want me to tell you what happened? If you want. I know the, the little bit of, of it. Well, so she used to do the Ouija board with her, our friend next door. And they used to do it all the time. We had a Ouija board, me and my other sister, and we would do it. But it never worked for us. But apparently, um, they, they got lots of stuff written down and and then it started getting darker information. I, I can't get the whole story. I get bits and pieces and I have to put it together myself. Anyway, so one time it said, the thing said, something bad will happen on uh, the Scotland Road. And we lived in a small little town, Winchester, New Hampshire. Every, everybody knew where that road was and there was friends that lived on that road. And in three weeks, my, sis my sister's friend, her husband, died in a car, uh, car accident on that road three weeks later. And she went and she busted up the Ouija board into pieces. This is the story I got. I don't know. The way she doesn't want to talk about it, I'm almost thinking there's something else that happened that she doesn't want to talk about. Yeah. So she busted it up into pieces. And then when we were moving out of that house, uh, up in her closet, she found another Ouija board. And that's another thing people say you have to actually burn it. Because it's, it keeps coming back, and I've heard stories of that too. So she flipped out on that, and I think it was we had two Ouija boards. You know, me and my sister right. used one, and they were using another, and we might have distorted it. And so she's she's like, oh my god, he's coming! Back. <laughs> yeah, that she was enough out. for her, though. right? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that was her bad experience. Uh, Sobering. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the other, her friend uh, had a baby with that guy and they were married. And so the, her baby grew up with a, a father, mm -hmm. you know, so it was pretty, it was pretty tragic. Well, it wasn't was. because of the Ouija board. Well, that's what I kept like, thinking, like, exactly, it's hold of a thing that might have been. Awesome. But there may have been an energy associated with it. Right. It plugged into whatever that information was, it could right. have had energy around it, and that, yeah. could, be, that could be pretty scary. I, I, yeah, I just know that she just absolutely doesn't well, even want to talk about it. People with psychic abilities um, get these warnings or, you know, forebodings, yeah. and, it, and that makes people um, suspicious of that whole realm of uh, extra perception, mm -hmm. you know? Right. right. That's true. Um, but 
But uh, anybody who's born with high levels of psychic energy either, you know, shuts it down and negates it or has, right. is taught to do so by their parents and uh, other environmental stuff, or they learn to do what we were talking about earlier, consciously direct right. their energies, their you own. know, so they can even live with them. Right, you know. right. Exactly. So, all right. So back before indicating how the energies of creative imagination should be directed, however, it seems best first to consider the images of the unconscious mind, of which it is the function of the creative imagination to form new combinations. Sources of images used in creative work, and that's a Pollock text and Pollock. Um, the experiences, both physical and mental, which form the thought elements into the thought cells and thought structures comprise the unconscious mind. These experiences have combined with other experiences and fused according to the law of association. And then they are recalled into objective consciousness in conformity to this law. Yet the individual has a certain power to create new associations between the thought elements forming the thought cells into new thought cells. To form these new thought cells by associating them with other experiences is very like the process of discrimination. Discrimination requires that the important matters be selected and held before the attention apart from other unimportant material which was originally associated with it and reviewed. So you gotta kind of like pull apart your experiences and kind of look at what you wanna look at specifically. The process of separating images and other mental factors from experiences with which they originally were linked is called dissociation. And then I had to look it up because I was like, I thought that was like a bad word in psychology. <laughs> like, I you know, the decision. No, I found out why. And I have all these definitions, uh -huh. so we'll go through it. <laughs> <laughs> so, from a Wikipedia definition, a dissociation is a partial or complete disruption of the normal integration of a person's conscious or psychological function. In general, dissociation is a defense mechanism that everyone uses every day. It is in its most common form, mild dissociation includes daydreaming, zoning out, or doing things on autopilot. Um, in chemistry, uh, it's a general process in which ionic compounds separate or split into smaller particles, usually in a reversible manner. So it's the opposite of association recombination. So basically, the idea is taking apart something, right? Mm -hmm. From its original well, what body. What did it say below that thing when you go at the bottom? Dissociation is the opposite of association. Okay. Yeah, association. And that's how Zane was using the Right, term. exactly. Yeah. Um, but then I also found on these other um, psychology websites dissociation is thought to be a relatively common mental process engaged in by many people, not of all of whom have mental disorder. <laughs> Very mild forms of dissociation are quite common and are probably behind the experience of spacing out temporarily. Dissociation is a wonderful aspect of creativity and imagination. Think about the times when you were able to be the most creative. Sometimes creative folks need to enter into the twilight zone of dissociative states to really get their imagination going. So in other words, you know, it's not a bad word. <laughs> Well, psychologically. Uh, you know, are there any more definitions to cover? Well, because there's a more, you were talking about mild forms of dissociation, right. but the, because but that's very the commonly, ones. there's one, for, for instance, children who've been sexually or otherwise yeah. abused, right. but where the, you know, but that's, all memory of it is blocked right. and uh, it fragments the personality. You lose a part. Men who come back from war, right? And and uh, you know, it's it's. But th that's the thing, Laura. That's that's what I thought it was a bad word, and it is all that. But what Zane is using it as is to look at and to use creative. That's why I went in that direction. Because okay. yes, you're right. Absolutely. In a higher, more dissociative state, that's all those things do happen to people. But so that's why I I had a red flag. So I had to start looking it up, mm -hmm. and I found all these mm -hmm. websites. So there's degrees so, of it. Right. Right. And the mild form is helps you creatively. You just kind of and that, else and that space shamanic out. journeying that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's a lot about retrieving those fragmented, disowned parts of ourselves right. to integrate again. You yeah. know, in in a safe and make us more whole kind of way. Profound healing. Can you go back to where you used that word? Because I was getting a totally different meaning 
Discrimin okay, this is far discrimination. Back. Okay, it's the next one. The process of separating images and other mental factors from experiences with which they originally linked is called dissociation. And that, I, it's, you, the way I read that, yeah, was that it's 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 like taking this. It, an example of that might be you have you've gone through your a large portion of your life thinking a particular thought about yeah. something. And all of a sudden, one day, something happens that causes you to start picking that thought apart, yeah. to examine it, to go, wait a minute, does this really work? Is this logical? Is this... I, that's what I was thinking yeah. you meant by yeah. association. Or, and I like agree you with you. That it's a logical before. process, I'm not, not a daydreaming have... kind of thing. Right. You, well, you're going to start with that, but then... I think it could be conscious or un, or logical or not, you know, okay. not. But um, I think pulling there's apart some point at which, you know, I might realize it's uh, it's irrational, or in that sense it's a logical process, for me to have a prejudice against everybody named Sue, right. or against yes, all yeah. Leos. Right, right, you know, right, right, right. So that's where, whereas previously apart. we had made an association, we are now making a useful dissociation exactly. so we can get more sane. That's, that's my opinion of it too. So these ideas come from, these are the definitions of dissociation that we've got zoning out, whereas right. the process of separate, he's, so he's kind of talking about in the chemistry sense. Yeah. Kind of the pulling apart of the molecules. I think that's what he, how he's using So in the chemistry, that's the, that's the definition. So I guess in the psychology so new of combinations things. could be possible then. Right, right. exactly. Right. And that in that regard would be creative. Right. But see when you're zoning out, you're kind of you're separating yourself from current reality. And you're kind mm -hmm. of zoning out, you know. That's another right. state of it. Okay, yeah. Creative imagination must make use of dissociated <laughs> state ideas or images. <laughs> I just read this savage chicken. <laughs> oh, that's great. I know. <laughs> that's like we create God in our own image. <laughs> I was driving behind a bumper sticker that said, create, be your own God. You know, create your own God. But have you ever seen that um, the cartoon with the two fish in the fishbowl? And one fish says to the other, what's this thing I hear about? Water. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Isn't it? <laughs> right. Uh, Zane wrote, some persons have great difficulty in dissociation. As if that's a bad thing. They are un unable to originate any marked variation in methods of work, unable to form an opinion of work that they have not already heard expressed, and their mental processes are too tight. I think when, like, when I was a kid, there would be like this a family friend or something that would always say, like, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers was absolutely the best football team. And, you know, like, certain little things like this. Van Eddie Van Halen was the best guitar player. And I had that in my head. Like, I believe that everybody else believed that because I was told that, right? <laughs> right? And it wasn't until later that I pulled apart and I realized Whoa. that is an opinion. <laughs> and it, but, you know, those types of things. And that's what, you know, I think that's what you're talking about. You, know, yeah. you just pull them apart. That's why um, I just love that ancient Zen teaching from, from, you know, way before Christ. No need to seek the truth. Simply cease to cherish opinion. <laughs> cease to cherish well, opinion. Well, cherish opinion. People with a small imagination often have a great fund of knowledge, which has been integrated into the mind as it was received, but subjected to no process of dissociation in which it has been examined in a large variety of ways and in new combinations. Thus it is that those people of much learning often are so hampered by fixity of the contents of their minds they cannot adapt themselves. That's true. And I like that <laughs> quote. Imagination is more important than knowledge. <laughs> That's great. Uh, those people, however, who have the individualistic urges more prominent, such as are mapped in the birth chart by a prominent planet Uranus, find dissociation easy. 
The thought energies mapped by Uranus tend to act as alternate currents, attracting strongly for a time, then as strongly repelling. This breaks up the mental fixity, enabling new combination of ideas to be made. Uranus gives originality. Mental fertility depends upon the amount and supply of material within the unconscious mind and the ability to dissociation. Then the mental contents, supply of material, must be broken up, severed from the fixity of their original association. The ability to do this may be cultivated through the habit of viewing experiences from various angles and in diverse combinations. The unconscious mind has within it, or easily accessible, a vastly wider field of information than has the objective mind. The objective consciousness has at its disposal only those images and ideas which can be brought up through the process of memory in a manner that they impart vibratory energy to the physical brain cells. And because the physical brain cells offer resistance to the process, making new and complex combinations of mental factors in this way is a laborious process and consumes much electrical force. If you're trying to do it. Right. <laughs> When the conscious mind has its attention focused on creating something new through the use of the imagination, it has three sources from which to draw its materials. They are stored experiences of the soul from its evolution through lower life forms, um, two, using the psychic faculties of the soul during sleep to learn about the astral plane, and tuning in on other intelligences both on the physical plane and on the astral plane who have the kind of information one seeks. The only problem I have with that is, what if they're telling you something erroneous? Well, they, well that's, that's when you appeal. I mean, because even people, the... even regular people that were going out seeking knowledge, you can ask somebody that has all this knowledge, and they might have a, a lot of good knowledge, but they might have a little bit of a thing that wasn't true, you know what I mean? The, the, which so, is why you have to always discriminate. Be willing to, yeah. So I guess on this plane, yeah. Observe the information, but... Observe how it interacts with reality, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess these are the sources of where you can use uh, get. Neil made some comments earlier that yes. I didn't catch. Okay. Uh, he said uh, dissociation is one of the defense mechani mechanisms used by the unconscious and discovered by Freud. It is used by all at one time or another. Freud implied that it was something that had to be removed from the unconscious in order to be a whole person. Yeah. It has changed today. And then he says, cognitive psychology uses this technique of dissociation much more to the benefit of the individual today. Right. Yeah, I had read something too that uh, Jung and, and Freud, they have different opinions of dissociation. And um, they have different opinions of lots of <laughs> but yeah, that whole thing, like I, I told Laura, that was all a part of dissociation, but I, I focused in on mm -hmm. the one area but that I thought Zane was talking about. about. What mm -hmm. Neil pointed out, and, yeah. and Freud's role in its definition and all. And it's interesting, because it kind of goes along with that ancient shamanic belief that the soul can get fragmented and needs to be made whole again if, if it's going to get healed. Mm -hmm. you know? or. But, but also, it sounds to me like uh, this dissociation thing is if it's put together in, in not a good way. There's things yeah, that you trauma can dissociate it and kind of rearrange it a little yeah, bit back right. together. Yeah, right. That would be that chemical combination. Uh -huh. You free it up for recombinant, right. 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 Yeah. right? work. But yeah. yeah, and then the person must be ready for that integration. <laughs> that's why the defense mechanism right. is there. That person has to be ready to be integrated and to reassociate mm -hmm. both. Right. Yeah, it right? has to be a safe world for it that does. to happen. Yes, yes. It does. Mm -hmm. So, the degree of intelligence displayed in selecting the material depends upon the organization of the unconscious. Also, the energy put into that search depends upon the intensity of the desire. If the desire is intense enough, it will explore widely in the astral world. Is that what that is? Exploring widely in your actual mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I love pictures like that. <laughs> Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. <laughs> and that's Albert Einstein. <laughs> that's great. If the desire is intense and energy is at its command, the individual leaves no stone unturned when not hampered by the conviction that all knowledge must come through reason and the five physical senses. The unconscious mind will work either on the physical or the astral plane toward acquiring the proper material for the creative imagination and work attempted. 
directed thinking and creative work. When the conscious mind has its attention focused on creating through the use of the imagination, it has the three sources from which it draws materials. I stated that earlier because I just, we're talking about it again, so I wanted to have it uh, pulled together, brought together. For efficiency in using these materials, there must be the power to discriminate and to do directed thinking. Fantasy thinking is too wasteful because it is strongly influenced by other desires. To start the unconscious mind on its search for material, there must be an intense desire to obtain a given result. The more desire energy diverted into a given enterprise, the more will be accomplished. And for creative imagination or other creative work, there should be a powerful supply of creative energy which through sublimation can be diverted into the enterprise decided upon. The competent artist or inventor, therefore, will read all that others have written relating to that matter, will talk with others, those interested in similar endeavors, and in all ways will endeavor to add to the material from which the unconscious mind can make selection. Such procedure also encourages the unconscious to follow a similar method of research on the astral. That was like that now please wait button I was referring to last week in the creative process where we feed our data into our conscious mind and yeah. then yeah. we press the process button and <laughs> the old computers would take uh, long enough that we'd get a now please wait screen. And I think this person who wrote this Understanding Creativity book was one of the people who, who identified that as a really important part of the creative process. And it's not it's under great. the conscious will. So right. it's not, there's more than just directed thinking, because directed thinking is our, is our conscious, right. it ego is. domain, right. you know. And, um, and that's where the effort and the energy expended is so high, but if we, if we have the ability to trust the unconscious part of the process too, right. that's when I try and try to be effortless right. becomes meaningful. And, and we let ourselves get uh, inspired and you know, envisioned and right. enthused. Well, what, what Zane is saying is, like what I what I've done is a research for this class, right? And I put all this stuff together, but I allow whatever comes up in my mind. Right. That's the allowing. Right. It pertains to something. Something strikes up. I can't direct myself and say, "Oh, I want to say something in this category." I can't. I have to allow it to yeah. express, and that's a creative thing. Yeah. The allowing. But I I I get a whole area of search and research that I can pull from, that I allow my subconscious though to pull from that, those experiences that I can't remember consciously, It'll, right. I allow it to do it. That's, and that's where fantasy about. thinking isn't necessarily a, a deleterious distraction. It can feed into the process. If, if it's part of our, oh. what, op what opens up as we're allowing, yeah. Yeah. then that too can become important. Well, I think he's saying in two different areas. Fantasy thinking is useful in one area, but in this area that he's talking about, he says I haven't it's heard him say a positive thing about fantasy thinking. <laughs> okay. I think he's very ego driven, you know, in his point of view here. Yeah. And that's okay. <laughs> we need to point out that he does he at least give ser lip service here to the unconscious mind and that it, it runs 90% of the show, you know. So yeah. why have a prejudice against that kind of process? It's part of the big I picture. Think I, I think what he's, what he, my, my take on what Zane has written about fantasy thinking is that it's, a lot of times fantasy thinking is an expenditure of energy and it takes away from the actual realization. Now, you can say that is or is not true or agree or disagree, but I think that's what he's, when he's talking about fantasy thinking, I think that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's talking about, I mean, it, actually, you know, with that whole thing that you were talking about with the computer where you put it on the, you know, the, bu the pause button or whatever it is, that's actually the third stage of magic, which he talks about a lot, and that's Make what this whole bit, this creativity <laughs> process is that, the, it's the will is that first stage right. that you were just talking about, exactly. and then you do the inner, you know, you energize. Yeah. Then you have to let it go in yes. order to achieve, realize the result. Allow the, the unconscious to happen and everything else to pull up. Right. Yeah, because I, I, I wish I would, you know, get a little bit better at that. 
pulling apart Zane, what he's talking about. Because he does talk about, there is importance in fantasy thinking. There yes. is things in other chapters. He's talked about that. It's a time and a place. And in this area, he's, he's going through a whole process. So he's saying that fantasy thinking just wasn't, it, it, for this process, doesn't really work. It kind of, you know, depletes. Well. I mean, I hear what you're saying because I think everything has the purpose. dream. He's talking about dream. You know, you can use your dreams to yeah. 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 and he to talks about that. To, uh, to demonstrate something, right. to bring magic into your life. Exactly. And I mean, is that fantasy? Well, a lot of the things that come to my mind while I'm dreaming. <laughs> are I mean, so I don't think he's dismissing fantasy. I think he's just. I think what he's trying to do is just talk about the difference. Yeah. And, and, and I know they, people who expend their life's energy in fantasy. Yes, uh, yeah. They talk about what they're you. going to do, and they never right. do anything. Right, right. Um, so that's, I think that's all mm -hmm. he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. How to be effective with our energy in the yeah, long run. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I like your um, analogy with the stages of magic. Yeah. And that was, you know, part of what was was pointed out in that book on creativity uh -huh. that it was a stage it was it was a later a stage after you've already you yeah. know got the thing rolling with your desire body uh -huh. and you're gathering information and you're you know yeah. pumping it you all into the computer and everything yeah, right. kind of you're, you're well along you when, when you get the benefits of the let go and allowing stage right. Yeah. Right. Oh. back to imagination <laughs> Truly creative work implies the use of imagination, and there are various kinds of imagination. Imagination is used by science and all discoveries except those purely accidental. Let us now examine the kind of imagination used by the materialist, the mystic, and the occultist. Excuse me. The materialist. In philosophy, the theory of materialism holds that the only thing that exists is matter, that all things are composed of material and all phenomena, including consciousness, are the result of material interactions. Um, this is all from Wikipedia. In other words, matter is the only substance. As a theory, materialism is a form of physicalism and would be in contrast to idealism and spiritualism. So that was just a Wikipedia definition. This is Zane's definition. The aim of the material sciences is to reproduce in his imagination the relation and processes of nature in all exactitude. All too frequently, he restricts the material used to, to the reports of the five senses, and even then discards any observations which go against his schooling and which gives him prejudice. I would say Rockefeller is a materialist. <laughs> <laughs> That's an opinion, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and Sagan, I would say he's a materialist, too. He uses carefully ascertained facts presented clearly, but only in the proportion and arrangements found in nature, and with no distortion used by the imagination. He's the exact antithesis of the mystic. Well, there was, uh, you know... Carl Sagan? Carl Sagan. Paul yeah, loves he, Carl Sagan. Oh. Well, I... No, I... Yeah? Not really. Okay, I, so what about... But uh, he is an interesting character, and, you know, he died of cancer pretty young. Oh. Not much... Not that many years after... Wasn't it in the 60s or 70s that he died? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, no, it was, was probably, probably in the probably 80s or something. Oh. But I think he was developing some... He was moving in the direction of a more spiritual... Yeah, yeah I don't think he was um, not... I don't think he was a materialist at all. I think he was... But he wasn't a cultist. He wasn't no. an occultist. And He's he wasn't a mystic. Well, that's the yeah. thing about the scientists. They, they have their opinions, right. and they may be religious, or they may be into spiritual stuff, but when they're talking about their work, Right. They do not, you know, they want to be very clear that that is not influencing your scientific work because right. it impacts their whole right. status in the community. You know. Yeah, and part of the science, the, the definition of valuable science is that it be repeatable, exactly. you know, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, reliable information. Yes. So the materialist has hypnotized himself into the belief that all phenomena can and must be explained by material processes. When phenomena originating on the actual plane are presented to him, he concludes they can be explained by some as yet undiscovered law of matter. He believes his eyes and ears and feelings only so long as they present no proof that there is any realm other than the physical. That's the materialist. Oh, may I make another comment? Yes. 
you know, Vicki uh, pointed, you know, said that she was kidding me that I love Carl Sagan. Actually, I do like the guy. And one of the reasons I do is because in 1977, there was this scientist, not very well known, yeah. who, you know, they can't stand the, 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 the idea that, uh, that the common people would believe in astrology. Yeah. just drives some of them crazy. Okay, they think it's pure superstition. Right. They've never looked into it, right. they anything about it. But, exactly. And he went and he put together a pamphlet that talks about, um, you know, the earth really goes around the sun, you know, and all kinds of things like that, and went around and got scientists, like about 160 or 70 yeah. scientists, to sign this thing, and what it talked about is how astrology is a bunch of BS, and here's the reasons. And um, Carl Sagan wouldn't sign it. He said, well, actually, there's no science in this thing at all. Right. It's just talking about things that everybody obviously knows, but there's no science in it. There's no proof against astrology in it, and so he wouldn't sign it, and I always thought that was... That's cool. Well, there was a scientist who uh, set out to disprove astrology and ended up doing some very convincing proofs of yeah, astrology. That's, that's, uh, go, go, G -A go, 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 Material scientist endeavors to make every image definite and an exact representation of an external fact. A photograph may accurately represent something, yet be inartistic. To paint art accurate to life in color and in detail, the picture of a lovely woman is not art, but to give only such lines and colors as will stimulate the imagination of each person viewing it. To construct a mental picture such as most lovely to a person. To see what someone specifically most ardently desires is art. Mm, Although photography is art too. I believe. Okay, yeah. now we're going to talk about well, the mystic. <laughs> so the mystic pays no attention, whatever, to facts of. Okay, so he is very opinionated, and I don't think he likes mystics. Yeah. <laughs> so bear with me. Let's get through it, and then we can discuss the mystic thing. The mystic pays no attention, whatever, to facts of the objective world, but relies entirely on his imagination to create a world such as he desires. Where the material scientist endeavors to make every image definite and an exact representation of an external world fact. The mystic uses suggestive symbolic images <laughs> and creates an ideal universe according to his own conception of how the universe should be, which he projects outward. Okay. Mystic literature, consequently, so long as it is mystical, is always obscure, ever hinting, suggesting, and insinuating, but seldom giving concrete, reliable facts stimulates the reader to picture things as the reader would have them. This is from the Tao Te Ching. Which is more valuable, health or wealth? Which is more harmful, winning or losing? I think that uh, validates what he says. In other words, mm -hmm. mystical stuff does not tell you reliable, concrete facts. It's not telling you anything. It's questioning. Right. But I think there's absolute value in the mystical area. Well, and I don't think he would, I don't think Zayn would disagree with that. Right. Well, okay. Mystical thought is vague done? because it is mere yeah. fantasy. He says it's mere fantasy. And I wrote, or it's just not understood by his mind yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, mind. because he is kind of being prejudiced against it. Yeah, he's, he's, he's being very all or nothing. Yeah. And he has a bias because if you go back to, back into the uh, you know 20s and 30s, uh, back then, um, there was a lot of mysticism with to, uh, the kind that he felt was okay. took advantage of inappropriate or took advantage of people or I had a feeling he stuff had like a, that. A bias. He had some historical uh, yeah, bias. I and so saying. he clearly has a bias. Our definition of the mystic might be different. Than yeah. Well I have some mine. pictures of who I think are mystics, so um, and the imagination left to itself exaggerates the significance of symbols which it uses and stops at no extravagance. So he's, you know, it's his opinion. I think Edgar Casey was a mystic, but that's, that's a Buddha. And today, as in the past, fantastic ideas are being created by mystics and taught as truth. I think that's where so he may have had some experiences with people that 
quote unquote, were kind of mystics, or he thought they were mystics, or whatever, and he couldn't. And it, they might have been, you know, bad, doing bad things or whatever. But that's not the true definition of what a mystic is. They are accepted by other mystics because they find in such notions the things they desire to find in the universe. They say that a notion appeals to them, hence they accept and act upon it. Is that the Buddha there? Yeah, and there's another statue. Of the Buddha. You know, Buddha is a mystic. Had provided some. <laughs> the Buddha well, was what, an what empiricist. He? But he, yeah, he provided some really practical, absolutely, and he wouldn't accept I any conjecture thinking want. unless it, it has proof within his own experience. And, yeah. and he. He urged yeah. other yeah. people not to believe stuff that they hadn't experienced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You can call him a, I think, if you want to call him a mystic, I should okay. have a definition of mystic. You know, it, it yeah. comes down to definition. Yeah. Right, well, right. What I think of really more is. is that a mystic is someone who can perceive the wholeness of <laughs> rescue and everything. Rescue. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably what he was thinking in terms of. Right. And that's or, and I, I think he had some, there were some issues in the Brotherhood of Light between the, um, the um, Blavatsky and Burgoyne, and they, you know, they, but they were they occultists. Well, they, the, the, they he, were, they. Was it occultists? No, or a mystic. In his, I think. See, his, there you go. There's the right. definition. And, of and what she, exactly. uh, yeah, and I think some of the things that, that they later found out, as K. Paul Johnson pointed out, was that a lot of the things that they were doing that seemed so mystical, mystical demonstration, and da 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 da, da actually was the result of a servant in the back room causing all these demonstrations but that, to happen. That goes along with the definition yeah. of occultist. Exactly. Think, right? Not she mystics. did call herself an occultist, didn't yeah. she? Yeah. She I, studied. I don't think that's what she, mystics yeah. covers. Exactly. A mystic is more like a, a per, I would say he was one of the mystics, even though, because I, I, I watched a movie about his, his life a little bit. You know what I mean? That, to me, he had like this bad you know, bad character thing going on, but he did have a mystical thing about him, where, you know, what? I'm sure. Okay. Uh, and I think some people's mind, that can have a bad connotation, that being a mystic, even though he did give certain information to that, the Tsar's wife there, that, that family, yeah. the Russian Tsar yeah, family. Yeah, he gave her some good information, but he was a bad character. He had a bad yeah. character temperament. When I think see, of the great it, mystics, I don't think of bad characters, you know. Well, but, you know, some people say that that he was a mystic, you know what I mean? Because there are things about his life that were. About, you know, I'm uh, Burgoyne. T.H. Burgoyne, who was an occultist. Okay, a, so there were against the occultists. He, he a, <laughs> but but so I, a I'm also thinking, think of him as a bit of a mystic. Yeah, see, so it's all a definition, and I'm it's going all to the same as, yeah. Well, I so, think Zane called him a mystic. Who? And it, Burgoyne. Uh, Burgoyne. He also talks about the first decanate of Pisces as being the mystic, you know, it's to the, the decanate of born. the mystic to the man are born. Right. And I mean, I've got Pis I've got that first decanate of Pisces rising. And yeah. as a kid, I was very mystical. The, you okay. know, I, I, it, which I always interpreted to mean there are a lot of mysterious things. And I was curious about them. I was curious about why they, you know, what made them happen, and I think, in, on a positive level, I think that could be what a mystic is. Well, and the mystic, I think, throughout the ages in the varying religions, um, when you study it academically, you realize that there's this group of people who are saying that their meditative experiences have brought them to a state where they dissolved into the oneness that is. They perceived that all, we're involved in one whole thing here. And there's no way you can get to that with your discriminating scientific materialistic right. mind. Right. It's a perception that transcends uh, you know, the five senses. Mm -hmm. And no matter what religion you study it in, they're all saying basically the same thing about their experience, that it was ineffable, they can't describe it in words, mm -hmm. even though they try, and when they try they say, they dissolved into the oneness of, they lost themselves into this greater reality, you know, and that's ubiquitous. Every religion, every time frame, they, we have people who've described that experience. 
that to me is what true mysticism is. Yeah, I, and I would agree with you. And I think this comes down to definition. So, um, in my opinion, Zane is discriminating. He doesn't mention any names in his book, but he is kind of discriminating because who he believes is a mystic, who he believes is an occultist, is not necessarily what is truth, right? In my opinion. So I think he's making statements about the mystic, the materialist, and the occultist. You know, he can make those statements of definition, but, you know, it's... Well, I, I think he's defining it. Okay. He, in doing that, he provides his definition right. Right. of what a mystic and an occultist is. Right, yeah. and I just went through these slides. I didn't read them because we're, we're, we're running out of time here. So I wanted okay, to get to the occultist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Whoa, that's some thunder. All right, so do the intensities of his desires and the readiness with which material can be brought up from his unconscious. No form of imagination exceeds in fertility that of the mystic. His ingenuity often is amazing. And coupled with this is the general belief that all which is received from within must be true. Um, yet we should not consider an imagination valueless, which does not, like that of the material scientist, reproduce nature exactly in a proper proportion. To give a plain statement of fact must be, may be scientific, but is never literature. Literature, which is an exalted value, appeals to the feelings and common associations, the details being left to the imagination. It is what is left unsaid as much as is that which is related that makes literature. Um, Back to a mystic. Common sentiments. Yes. You know, you know? Yes. Uh, Alice Marie asked the question, would you say Nostradamus was a mystic or an occultist? I'd say he's an occultist, in my opinion. <laughs> Let's get on well, to it. Well, people would say mystic, but yeah, Neil says right. he heard the thunder. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. I want to hear what the definition of occultist is before I consider yeah. that question. <laughs> okay. Mystical type of imagination because it surpasses all others in ingenuity in the diversity of material it can assemble is most useful. When the mystical imagination is checked by experimental methods, it becomes one of man's greatest assets. There you go. So it yeah. I guess it's, it's just definition. Well, okay. There are a How lot of people who are, sorry, there are a lot of people that are way out there on some limbs that just don't match reality at all. Mm -hmm. I would agree, but I, yeah, some people, I wouldn't That's call them mystic, true. I would call them people. <laughs> yeah. How the occultist differs from the mystic and the materialist. So, in my opinion, these were occultists. The occultist differs from both the material scientist and the mystic. In fact, he may have qualities of both, but he uses all possible means, internal and external, to check the accuracy of his knowledge. So this is, this is uh, Aleister Crowley. Oh, oh it is. he's a mystic? I mean, not a mystic, a cultist, an occultist, yeah, because sure. he used occult stuff, and you know, yeah, in the use of black magic. I would agree with and, that. And Vlasky yeah. was too. I mean, I think. And then the a prime occultist, though, like the mystic, he may imagine something, <laughs> but before accepting it as a reality, he devises ways and means of testing its truth and facts as to their accuracy. The occultist rejects no facts reported, regardless of the plane of their origin. And that's so he same. takes. All of this, I would say Zane is an occultist, wouldn't you? I'm he sure takes, he would define himself that way. Well, because the definition of the mystic is more, I mean, a true mystic, not people with just mystical qualities about them. I would say a true mystic, like a Buddha, to me, is like a mystic. Um, they're, they're different that they, they have the knowledge of the truth within already. Whereas an occultist is studying both the physical world and the occult, the occult world and all the paranormal and all the interesting things. And they take those two things, they take science and the uh, stuff that they can't do with science, and they put that together and they try to, to see the world through those terms. And that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Zane was doing, because he's yeah. taking from the astral world, yeah. he's taking from the physical world, and you're trying to get a whole good picture of stuff and using it. Would you agree? <laughs> I would say Hermes just in this case, was an First or yeah. a mystic. Maybe he was a mystic. Um, but he seemed, I don't know, I guess the definition thing has to come back. And having a so much wider field from which to draw information from both the physical realm and the astral realm than does the material scientist 
the occultist is able to construct a far more perfect concept conception of the universe. You know what? It occurs yeah. to me that it might be kind of that, that trying to set, call people one thing or another thing yeah. may not be good. Maybe right. what it's just good is just to kind of consider, well, what, what are these distinctions that are being drawn here? Right. And which one seems to, you know, what's valid about all of the different approaches? This well, I think we you know, combines the two. Zane was exemplifying black and white thinking uh -huh. in his definition of the materialist and the mystic. Yes, and yes, finally, exactly. we're in his definition of the occultist, he tried we're getting to, to some value because, uh, yes, he tried we're getting to, to the right. a range, the, yes, right. indeed, the synthesis of that. I, you know, I would say this, the, you know, the Church of Light, the Brotherhood of Light is an occultic. It's, it's taking both the physical science and the unexplainable yeah, yeah. and trying to understand it all. Yeah, right. right. Although, boy, uh, in our culture, occultist is not generally considered a positive word, you no. know. For us to go around um, claiming Calling that that's what we're positive. doing it right. was, is uh, asking for misunderstanding. Right. Well, Aleister Crowley is considered an occultist, Blatsky is considered an occultist, and yet we have bad well, we, ideas of those people and well, their, but I think what they did, they were they were working as an occult in the well, occultic idea, meaning they're taking from both worlds. Yeah, but, but um, the Church of Light is dedicated to the highest good of all. Right. And uh, exactly. black magicians were not necessarily dedicating their work, no matter how right. brilliant or imaginative or scientific right. they were in the way they were doing it. Exactly. So even and though we're both occultists, we're working for the higher good for everybody. Right. But so, by like Crowley or say. some other right. magician. Yeah, Crowley exactly. has a bit of a shadow around. A big shadow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> the field of information of the materialist is too narrow. That of the mystic is broad enough, but in his mental processes there is a tangled mass of fancies interwoven with a few facts gleaned from actual astral experience and usually warped from all semblance of the truth by the dominant religious emotion. The occultist in his research makes use of such methods as are reliable that are employed by both the material scientist and the mystic. Combination of the two. But whatever type of imagination is used for constructive purposes, the general principles are the same. Number one, there must be supplied the unconscious mind as a wide variety of material relevant to the enterprise as possible. There must be intense desire and energy straining for release in the direction of the contemplated mental creation. And finally, there should be some facility for the product created by the unconscious to be recognized in objective consciousness. And there's about <laughs> 10 slides on rationalization. <laughs> um, and I have like three minutes. Do you want me to just kind of go through it? Just go through it. Okay. Closely related to the mystic type of imagination is a mental process called rationalization. This consists of arriving at a conclusion or doing something and then finding a plausible reason for it. And then the dictionary definition is to ascribe one's acts or opinions to, cause, to causes that seem valid but actually are not true, possibly unconscious causes. So you, you know, it might not be true, but you rationalize that it is. <laughs> the individual thus believes he has arrived at the decision through the process of reasoning or at least that it is something quite reasonable, when in fact it is largely or wholly a matter of wish fulfillment. It is said that love is blind. <laughs> it is so to the extent that desire for a certain perfection creates that perfection in the imagination and crowds out for the time being the image of reality. <laughs> I like your choice of milk <laughs> in there. <laughs> Not to mention the cucumbers. <laughs> She's blinded. Yeah. <laughs> Or she's blinding herself. A shrewd businessman, for instance, in selecting a mate, commonly finds physical beauty more attractive than brains. If his reason were dominant, it might deem intelligence more attractive. The release of the desires through the avenue of creative imagination is not always in the direction of beneficial endeavor. This is from the movie uh, The Invention of Lying. The beginning part was funny and then it got weird. <laughs> it was kind of a funny movie. Negative desires create the image of the condition that is not beneficial. And because the negative desire is held before the attention, action is in the direction of fulfilling this bad image. 
inimical image. This is the common rule, that any desire which is repressed, instead of having its energies diverted into some channel of expression, sets up streams of fantasy thinking within the unconscious mind, of which the objective mind is seldom aware, but which in some manner tends to find symbolic expression, often in our mistakes and blundering actions. You guys see this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's cool. Cool. <laughs> But also, if we feel angry at ourselves, this may lead to some form of accident. The resentment against self sets up a train of fantasy images released by the desire of the anger imparted to the thought cells. A group of thoughts has been endowed with the feeling that action should be taken against the self. Yeah, it's interesting. He calls those desires as well, those negative thoughts. Yeah, negative desires. desires. Yeah. yeah. And desires, and he just earlier on in the book, yeah. he talks about, he defines what a desire is, and, and this and it's an energy desire. with a magnetic quality to oh, it. Oh, right. right. Exactly, like the magnet. Right. It's, it's a magnet. Yeah. It's, a, it's an energy that you carry within you that magnetizes something. Right. Cool. Thanks. It is a very frequent thing for a person suffering from a severe disappointment to be accidentally hurt or killed. A train of fantasy thoughts commenced charged with the desire energies of one's brooding and part of the thought cells. When the unconscious accepts a suggestion to do something, creative imagination starts to invent a way for it to be realized in fact. And when conscious attention is off guard, giving the unconscious an opportunity to carry out what creative imagination has devised, such as when preoccupied with something, the unconscious brings the event to pass. So that makes sense, right? You're unconscious. It makes sense, but it made that that makes me very uncomfortable. I know. I don't because <laughs> like I hear a lot of people attribute bad things that happen to the unconscious. To, well, to the yeah, and I mean, and it just makes people feel bad. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't think that does anybody. Yeah. But anyway, that's my own opinion. You mean like a self-fulfilling? A self-fulfilling, yeah. Like right. someone gets sick, and it's their fault because they've got something that they're not dealing with. Well, yeah, that's probably that's true, right. but it doesn't make anybody feel good. <laughs> and it's not constructive well, information. For well, yeah, maybe not, not for the person that's sick, but it's constructive to other people who are looking for ways to not go in that direction. It can be. Yeah. But, you know, if the person's already sick, saying that to someone, no, it doesn't help them. But yeah. if you learn something about that before we start getting sick, like, I take that to heart when, when I have a, a pain or an ache, I start looking at, okay, mm -hmm. what's causing this? Right. And it, but, it's helpful to me to know that. Yeah, but sometimes people just have ge a genetic proclivity to something. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But anyway, I, I guess I just see a lot of, in, especially in new age kind of thinking, you mm -hmm. know, okay. people yeah. get really heavy into that. Oops. That makes me uncomfortable. The last slide, and I don't know what I'm doing. Well, I don't have to read the last so slide. So what does it say? Something <laughs> to and healing uh, etheric, oh. Uh-oh. Wait. No. Can't see it. Yes. Go to previous there and come back. It is a dangerous thing to entertain thoughts which we do not need, for they so easily slip past subjective consciousness into action in spite of ordinary vigilance. But the unconscious, through inventing ways to bring things to pass, is able to exercise a beneficial function. The unconscious becomes aware, through the psychic senses or through talking with others, that while the objective consciousness is asleep, many things are impossible for the objective mind to know without the unconscious mind's assistance. Some people can see many little signs of approaching events. That was segue into something else, and I had to just end it appropriately. But um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought this was valuable in the idea that, remember how we said we put things in our unconscious and um, and then the unconscious wants to work towards making that right. And you have to distinguish and you have to tell your unconscious, you know, I don't want this to happen. I'm just thinking of it. And then you stop thinking of it because then you're given it energy. And you're, right. You know, like you said with the bike and then that yeah. accident. You, you have to acknowledge it and then not focus and on then, the And then train your mind to not go there. Right. Because your unconscious else. mind is, it, it almost seems like it doesn't have a filter. It takes everything in, takes everything in like a sponge, and you have to use it and start putting things right. together that make sense. Well, and, and it responds to feeling, and I think that's why he talks so much about yeah, induced yeah. emotion it, and directed thinking. Right. Because 
that's what the unconscious mind responds to. Right. Is it wants to fulfill what it, you know what it feels like you want. Right. And, uh, anyway. uh, and I think for next week, the last class next week, I think I'm going to try to pull together the most important parts of the whole book, and maybe not mm -hmm. go. Maybe just pull a few things out of chapter twelve. But just kind of recap the whole idea of the book and all the important parts that I thought. Okay. Oh, Would that be okay? I want to see you like this subject because this is sort of the graduation, um, you know, the graduate course of everything we've been dealing with so far. Right. We're, we're a lot aware of how to manage our conscious mind and our physical reality in a sense, but this gets us to a higher level of subtlety in being able to um, use this teaching yeah. thoroughly. And so Well, that's what I want to do. I want to use yeah. it. It helped yeah. <laughs> help my life. <laughs> I have to understand it first. <laughs> yeah. What is he You're talking about? You're doing a wonderful right. job. Yeah. Thank you so well, much. Um, thank, you. Well, thank you guys for uh, hanging out and discussing, because I'm always asking for discussion. This time we just got a little... <laughs> but I love actually I love the discussion. It's it's yeah. it's so yeah. important to it helps understand. And I like the comments about. from people who are people looking at yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much guys out there. Thank yeah. you everybody mm -hmm. and we'll see you next week for the last class and I'll do a summary of everything. Mm -hmm. A little bit of chapter twelve, but a summary of just about the important points. Yes, Paul. Neil says great going you bet. The picks are relevant and plenty. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting harder to come by. <laughs> That's why she's going to do a recap. Of right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All the pictures that I already have. <laughs> as long as we get plenty of the, the pretty boys. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> George Cleveland. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> we like that. Right. Okay, so, uh, say goodbye. Oh, goodbye. Alice Marie says thank you. You've had a great class. Did Alice Marie get her question answered? So. Well, uh, you know, the question was, is Nostradamus a mystic or an occultist? I would call it definitely a mystic with no bad connotation at all. Yeah. Because it's basically because what he didn't he did, have the future to corroborate with as an occultist. No. Right. I mean, he was just seeing visions of the future. Yeah. But he wrote them down. Kind of mystic. Yeah. Whereas the mystic doesn't, rare, uh, to me, in my mind, a mystic lives it. He doesn't, he'll talk to people like the Dalai Lama, but he doesn't have to sit there and scientifically write stuff down and go through it. Whereas Nostradamus, he, he, he made perfume, you know, he had a wife and kids, and he, and he had visions, and then he wrote it down. Um, because his visions and stuff were, it, there's like a code out there, I swear to God, there's a code to unlock that. <laughs> I think it's somewhere, but anyway, the, just because he had, uh, uh, you know, predictions of the future, and that seems mystical, in my mind, because he was so practical and he used practical things, and he did practical things, that in my mind, I would that's why I would call him a cultist. A mystic sure. is more like the wandering monk, that if you talk to him, he'll say things in and, and weird using, phrases, but you're like, what the heck? <laughs> using extrasensory perception is not necessarily mystical at all. It may be, you know, it's a very valid sense in the two of them. Right. Okay, well, say goodbye now. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>